Welcome back. Hopefully so far in our mini-series on differentiable programming, we have illustrated some of the potential of this exciting new technology and how it has developed gradually over the last few decades from relatively humble beginnings. Today, we're going to conclude our short series by looking a little bit more at some of its potential use cases and the far-reaching consequences this can have when applied to a supply chain. So Johannes, what are some of the problems which we can improve our approach upon by using uh, differentiable programming? I mean, let's start maybe with um, the, the retail stores, you know, the, the point of contact with the customers. Um, right now, pretty much everything that is done in supply chain takes um, the time series perspective where you have a product and you observe units of demand being purchased um, or serviced, depending on what kind of shops you're running. Obviously, a shop in aerospace is not the same thing as a, 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 as a shop for a, a fast fashion store. But uh, the idea is that the angle is kind of the time series angle per product. The problem with this perspective, for example, is that um, things like cannibalization substitution that are very strong for, let's say, luxury or fast fashion or, many, or even food, actually, to a large extent, uh, food retail, it's, um, those things are super hard to modelize and they barely exist at all. I mean, there is many, many models where they don't exist at all. Um, differentiable programming gives you an angle to directly tackle the problem from the core of saying, well, I have a population of clients who walk into my store and who have, I would say, desire, needs, and who are going to pick or not pick um, things that are, uh, that are exposed to them considering the present assortment and considering the present um, stock availability in the store. So that's, that's, that's very interesting because here we are, um, uh, through something like differentiable programming, we can operate at a level that is not uh, the level of, I would say, a time series on top of the product references listed in the store. We can take the customer perspective. And that's that's something that um, that is very interesting and quite game changing because our experience was with I would say time series perspective. It's I mean usually the best you can do is just cut off duct tape your numerical models so that they are not too broken when facing cannibalization and substitution. But it's not it's 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 not very satisfying. It's it's duct tape as, at best. So let's maybe recap on what we've discussed in previous episode. What is that game-changing property that you sort of mentioned there that makes this all possible? And with a programming pattern, you can literally model the fact that client has a specific affinity to any product of your catalog. And you can literally write with a procedural process the fact that what if all my customers would be coming back? And, and just to give you some example, um, if, for example, I'm, uh, I have clients that do come back to my stores, maybe those clients are driven by novelty. And how do I model something as simple as once people uh, came into my store to buy, let's say, um, let's say a book, by definition, the, very, the client that has just acquired a book is when this client comes back, he or she is not going to buy the same book. You know, it's, it's pretty much by definition, it, they are only going to buy, uh, I would say, uh, another title, not the same. From a classical perspective, a time series perspective, it's, it's like impossible to, 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 to factor something as basic as that, as, as a returning client that walk into your bookstore, you know, um, uh, once per month is by definition not going to repurchase the same products. So if you see like a surge of demand for a book, chances are that um, the demand is going to be extinguished by the fact that if people, if all your uh, routine clients buy this, this new book that is of interest and very popular, then by definition, once they come back, they will not be buying it again. So obviously you can model that by, um, I would say, a time series perspective with a, a life cycle effect, where you see you, you introduce a new product, it, it has a spike at the very beginning at launch, and then demand only decrease. But that's a very indirect way of 
of, of modeling the problem much more direct way is the fact that as, as clients you know, visit your store, they see the product, and if they didn't buy the product, you know, um, uh, or if they do buy the product, then kind of by definition they won't next time they come back. So that's, that's a game changer in the way that you can very accurately model, I would say, in a ver much more, I would say, direct way, what is happening in the store. And that's, um, I would say, ver relatively blunt uh, insight about the business that you can inject in your machine learning model. So it, it's very interesting because so far, uh, prior to this sort of, of techniques, it was very, very hard to inject even super basic insights about uh, what the, the behavior of customers in the statistical models, which means that in turn, statistical models, ha we are facing a, a super, super difficult task of learning from scratch with like zero business insights. Okay, so that's kind of the point of sale. If we uh, take a sort of step back now uh, within your supply chain and we look at things maybe from a warehousing perspective, where does differentiable programming help us here? Is it all about forecasting future demand or where is it helping us? Um, let, let's consider, for example, a challenge that is also very, very hard to tackle at, um, uh, at the warehouse level. Um, for example, you want to smooth the flow. You see, your, your warehouse might not have like a storage capacity problem, but uh, frequently it has an input-output capacity problem. So it's, you have a whole network of, um, of clients to serve, which can be stores or, uh, or, or, or B2B clients of other kinds if, it's, if, you're, if you're, I would say, um, uh, a wholesaler, for example. But uh, so one of the challenges that you face is that you have probably thousands of, of products that you want to distribute to hundreds of sites uh, downstream, and you have your capacity limit in how much you can ship at any point of time. So ideally, you would like to be able to be very smart in the way that you organize your shipment so that you smooth, uh, the, 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 you smooth the curve of, of shipments from your warehouse and you avoid kind of, I would say, colliding shipments that produce a big spike where you need a lot more staff and it puts a lot of pressure on your logistic platforms. And that, that sort of problem, I mean, conceptually, it's fairly, it's fairly simple. I mean, it's just that if you could do small adjustment, you know, ship something one day prior or one day after, you could potentially smooth out a lot your, um, your operations so that it's much easier and cheaper to operate your warehouse so that you don't have to um, require as much, I would say, temp workforce, which can be very expensive. And sometimes they don't have the same level of training, so it creates tons of operational complexity. And is this something we couldn't do previously with kind of existing techniques? Uh, it, was, it was difficult because you see, once, um, if you do your, your forecasting at one stage, you know, okay, you forecast your demand, then you do your optimization. It's here you end up with a problem that is kind of a combination of both learning and optimization. You know, the two things are kind of go hand in hand. And then just consider a bit um, the, the number of degrees of freedom. So what do I mean by degrees of freedom is that we are talking of what are the, the variables that we try to optimize. It's all the shipments I want uh, to operate. So that's like w for every product that you can ship, for every uh, client that you have, uh, you have one degree of freedom. So if you have 10,000 products and 100 um, stores or that, that you want to supply, we are literally t t uh, talking about like 10 million SKUs per day where you have the opportunity to ship or not to ship. I mean, it, it becomes like a, an optimization problem that is not like cryptographically hard. It's not as if, you know, changing the value of one of those variables, so one SKU, how much do I send on a single day, is going to be a game changer for the whole picture. No, no, no. But uh, on the other hand, you end up with tens of millions of variables to optimize. And with traditional methods, I mean, traditional optimizer, it completely falls apart. And especially if you end up with plenty of subtle retraction effects, such as if you decide to deprioritize uh, um, a store so you don't ship, 
what you have to ship the next day for this store might be a quantity that is bigger uh, just, just because um, uh, the, the store might be even closer to running to a stack out, so uh, you need to ship more. And again, that's the sort of things where you have like feedback loop between what you decide, uh, what you forecast, and with, I would say, more traditional perspective, we could do this sort of optimization, but it was a lot more tedious because we had to do like stage analysis. And um, fundamentally, it was very hard to factor in all those feedback loops that exist in the system. Okay, and if we take sort of a final step back in that supply chain and look at things now from a manufacturing level, um, how does differentiable programming help us with some of these multi-echelon kind of challenges? That's, um, again, it's, it's, the problem is, is even more acute uh, because when you go to the realm of uh, multi-echelon you know, optimization, most of what is happening on every single node is kind of, in a way, inconsequential in the sense that it's an artifact. You do not care about the, 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 the stock availability at random point in your, um, in your complex network of, uh, of, of uh, I would say, parts and assemblies, etc., that end up at the very end into the finished goods. You know, the, the, only, the only point of the graph that really matters is whether you're serving your client on time, which, which is only a question that is relevant for the finished goods. So what about all the, the entire graph that you have behind? Well, the answer is that um, the fact that what is happening at every, at every single, I would say, intermediate steps, you know, all those, this complex graph of dependencies where you have all the, your, your bill of materials that are um, uh, generating this graph, all that is hap happening in this graph is, is fundamentally, I would say, um, uh, irrelevant. It's an artifact that only matter from the perspective of whether you are at the very end of the process serving your clients. And by the way, that was that is getting back to my criticism of, of DGMRP that was a couple of weeks ago, is that um, if you, you can adopt a binary coloring scheme on this graph and say that for certain nodes you want to achieve, you know, you, you want to have like high service level, but um, in, to a large extent it doesn't matter to have a high service level for a product if your clients um, do not care about this because they are not purchasing this product. The only thing they care about is um, whether the finished goods that you're selling are available or not. So how does, you know, a differentiable programming helps? I mean, it, it lets you model much more accurately what is happening in this network. So you have some steps that, ha that can have, you know, uh, probabilistic lead time or not. You might have steps where um, you have, um, for example, a certain fraction of the flow that do not pass quality control. Obviously, if you have like a perfect supply chain, you would have like 100% quality control. So if you have like 100, you know, uh, units of supply, you will have 100 units of finished goods, you know, that flows uh, after the, uh, let's say, machining step or extra, but sometimes you have quality control and your, your production system is imperfect and you might lose some quantities, for example, in, in pharma, when they have a very advanced biological process, you might actually lose entire batch of production because it's, it's like a culture of cells to produce, um, uh, I would say, the more advanced drugs. And despite decades of efforts, you know, it's when you, when you work with, uh, I mean, uh, living organism and that you, that's it, those living organisms are producing the chemical compounds that you want to extract that are going to be part of your drug, it's very, very hard to have like a process that is completely 100% reliable. It's, it's not like machining in the automotive industry. So, so is this where the idea of kind of modeling those outcomes that are not completely deterministic, is that where this kind of idea comes in? Yes, but also the fact that you can have very specific insights on the type of problems that you can have. For example, in the pharma industry, if you have, um, you're going to lose it's not going to it's not going to be like machining in the automotive industries where one part out of ten thousand doesn't pass a quality control. You know, it's 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 not uh, it's not like that. If you're in pharma and you have you have cultures of you know cultures that generates certain type of 
uh, of chemical compounds through, um, you might lose if you have a problem, you are most likely going to lose the entire batch of cultures that you have uh, in, in, this, in this plant. Um, so that, that completely, I would say, change the type of uncertainty and you can try to learn that from the data, uh, but it's difficult no, because you might not have, you know, 20 years of relevant data and it's, it's, you're kind of making the problem harder than it should be because you would like to be able to express this sort of insight that you know because it's, it's literally the physical reality of your business directly into the model. So the probabilistic approach is, is very good. It doesn't, you know, um, it's not exactly my point. It's my point is that um, what about having an approach like differentiable programming where you can frame, you know, uh, the problems that you're trying to learn so that you directly steer your machine learning algorithms toward the very specific, you know, sort of uncertainty that you expect to find because you know a lot of things about your network. That's, that's what I'm, and it can be a game changing because suddenly you need a lot less data to be super efficient. Okay, so what we're basically describing is that differentiable programming can really change depending on different verticals. Is that kind of right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the whole virtue is, lies in this idea of programming. So you, you want to, it's not an AI that will, you know, where you could just throw data and say learn. This is kind of the opposite of that. It's say, uh, well, data is sparse. Um, uh, uh, I want to have, um, I want to be very accurate, but I need to make the most of the, 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 the data that I have. It's not, this is not like, um, you know, um, Google trying to analyze a billion web pages. Uh, we don't have infinite data. Data is sparse, data is erratic. Um, data is very, very valuable because we don't have that many data points, so we really need to make the most. And uh, for example, if we want to get back to pharma and I want to, to make very, you know, insightful strategic forecast, there is the whole thing about patent expiration. You know, um, patent expiration is driving big pharmas. You know, they, they, you, you, product, you, you patent uh, uh, a drug and then when the patent expires, there is the risk that competitors enter your market uh, at a lower price and compete with you and force you to lower your prices as well. And thus, it can significantly reduce your margin. This patent expiry, expiration thing is for, for anybody who has any you know, familiarity with pharma, it's kind of completely obvious. And um, it, it's tr it has been driving you know, innovation and uh, and, and the activity of, of big pharmaceutical companies for decades. Um, if you expect that um, whatever machine learning algorithm is going to rediscover on its own this mechanism of patent expiration, that's, that's a bit insane. That's, that's, you're expecting way too much from um, the, the machine learning model. In contrast, differentiable programming is like a tool for a supply chain scientist to say, well, I know I have this patent expiration thing. I know what I do not know is exactly what is the likelihood of competitors entering, you know, the arena and competing with us with price. And what I do not know exactly is that how this thing is going to play out for us if suddenly we have to have the cap, the, the, the quantities that we sell um, just because other competitors did enter and we maintain all the same fixed costs. You know, if I maintain the same production capacity, then I have many costs that are completely flat, that do not depend on the quantity I produce. And it has, and thus, if I have competitors that enter the market, the effect on my margins can be completely non-linear. So that's, that's, that's so, so you're correct. It's, it's completely about being able to model the key insights that are specific from one vertical to another vertical by programming them into the machine learning model. Okay, and um, the problem many people might have with differentiable programming is it's, it's kind of fairly complex in some parts. I mean, are we sometimes using kind of a sledgehammer to crack a nut and it's kind of, there's more simplistic techniques that we could kind of still use? Um, I mean, you can always use more simplistic technique, but um, I think the key question is that, you, that the client should ask themselves, I mean, if you're running a complex supply chain is that, 
Can you really decide to ignore the complexity of the business you're operating in? I mean, for example, if if you are selling, um, let's say, uh, automotive parts, you know, on an e-commerce and you're servicing car parts, can you really ignore the, um, the problems that you have, you know, mechanical compatibilities between vehicles and parts and the fact that people who come to buy car parts on your website, they, it's, the, the real clients are not those people, they are their vehicles. So the, the vehicle is the ultimate client of, of, this, of those parts and you have at the core of the demand a problem of mechanical compatibility. So you have, and if you have many parts that are like a perfect substitute because they are all mechanically compatible to the same vehicle, it's like a, a super important aspect of your business. So what I'm saying is that um, this is an example where you need to embrace this because it's, it's really the core of your business. And yes, simplistic you know, approach that just ignore, for example, the, the, the part vehicle compatibility challenge, which is completely core uh, when you're thinking about automotive aftermarkets. Yes, it can work, but at the expense of being incredibly crude business-wise. So I see, I'm, I'm saying that in terms of sledgehammer, I say certainly you should not be using fancy tech for the sake of fancy tech. What I'm saying is that um, you sh if you are using something that just ignore like the, the key business driver of your business, uh, then whatever model you have is like incredibly simplistic. And, and don't expect that fancy numerical solution or whatever will actually solve the business problem that you have if your numerical recipe um, start by ignoring this business angle altogether. You know, that's, so my, my point is that you should be as simple as, as possible, but no simpler than, than what your business actually requires. Okay, I and mean, if we start sort of concluding today, I mean, previously at LOCAD, we had a very much programmatic approach. Um, what's the big change that differentiable programming is giving us, and how can companies kind of adapt to take advantage of that? Yeah, I mean, differentiable programming is, is indeed more of the same of this programmatic approach that has been like the motto of LOCAD for a, a long time. It's, um, it's now something where this programmatic approach goes at, into the core of our machine learning technology. It was not just our, into the core of our big data platform with mechanism to do like big data processing, but just, you know, simple filter and aggregation and typical pre-processing and data cleaning and whatever. That, that was already completely programmatic, but the, the, um, the machine learning core was, um, I would say, slightly rigid. And again, we had been, it, it has been something like an incremental process. I mean, with deep learning, we were already a lot more flexible than what we had with our previous generation before. But uh, it's, a, it's a new stage. And for our clients, I believe that's um, the opportunity to revisit many problems and many, many situations where we, in the past, had done a lot of, I would say, duct tape, you know, um, when you don't have something that is flexible enough, you, you kind of duct tape the thing by having clever tricks, but they, they are not necessarily as, um, as scalable as we want them to be. They, they might not be, they might be a tiny bit crude and they might approximate the, the business inside in undesirable ways. Uh, and here it's the opportunity to revisit all of that and just do pretty much the same thing, but uh, in a way that is leaner in terms of execution and more performant in terms of accuracy when we count in euros or dollars of error um, uh, business-wise. Okay, great. Well, thanks for your time today anyway. So that's everything for our mini-series on differentiable programming. We'll be back next week with another episode on a new topic. But until then, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.